Welcome to episode 125 of the support. <laughs> what the hell? Well, our YouTube listeners get to see that blooper, so yeah. that's great. Funko <laughs> Mary went <laughs> zooming by on a rocket, apparently. But was she a meteor shining brightly? Oh, see? Wow. I can hope you yet. Not All bad, right. not bad. Okay. Welcome to episode 125 of the Civil War Breakfast Podcast. Tonight, I am joined by the most awesome Civil War that I know, Darren. I told you I was going to say that. Um, and I am his co-host, Mary, and I'm about as good at introductions as Patrick Claiborne was at writing poetry for women, which I'm sure we'll talk about in this episode. Okay, well, that uh, came out of nowhere. Yep. How's it going? How, how's it going on? How's, how's our post-St. Patty's Day Mary doing today? Good. It's good to be back recording again. And like I said, we are doing... Uh, the Confederate half of our um, March episode, which last episode we talked about the Union Irish Brigade. And this week we are talking about a Confederate subject, General Patrick R. Claiborne, which we've mm -hmm. been wanting to talk about for quite a while. We've mentioned him in quite a few episodes, but we're that's finally true. getting down to talking about his life. So this might be a longer episode, but but that's all right. So, But before Perhaps. we get to that, oh. what are you drinking? I'm not going to lie to you. I'm pretty sure you forgot on that one, Mary. I am drinking, it's called, um, well, it's called Bird of Prey by Vanish Valley. Um, I'm drinking that because my boss called a hockey team one tonight, and they're on their way to get another championship. And I'm drinking it out of my Chickamauga coffee mug because although Chickamauga is a, um, a small part of the episode we're going to talk about today, it is an important part nonetheless. Mm -hmm. That being said, Mary, what are you drinking on this fine Friday evening? I am drinking She Makes Waves, which is a collaboration brew that Untold Brewing did with another local brewery. I'm not sure which one. Um, I just know it's a collaboration. Um, and I'm drinking it out of um, my Civil War Breakfast Club mug, which was the very first mug we came up with. And it's uh, got Alexis and David Rose on it from Schitt's Creek. And Alexis has yeah. a Kepi hat on it. So that was the first mug that you came up with for our podcast. So I'm using that tonight. Very good. Very good. As I went usually, way old school. You did. And the, the more you drink, I'm sure the better it'll get. But anyway, oh, Mary, yeah. we're going to talk about this episode today. And as we've mentioned before, St. Patrick's Day is a fuzzy thing of the past for both of us, but mm -hmm. our Irish eyes are still smiling. And Maybe. we are focused again on the their impact on the American Civil War. Now, you know, this time we're going to go deep behind Confederate lines to talk about a different kind of Irish soldier. That would be the rebel general, one Patrick Ronan Claiborne. And we're going to talk a lot about this. And like you said, you've been wanting to uh, talk to him for a while. Yep. And Patrick Claiborne, you know, he's one of those Civil War generals that certainly has a romanticism about him. Mm -hmm. You know, basically from his Stonewall, from his child childhood to some academic misfortune he had that led him to join the military. And ultimately his, his days with the Confederate Army, you know, his reputation is, is, is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And then he will ultimately earn the nickname, the Stonewall of the West. Yep. And he's very much, you know, in doing this episode and researching it, I mean, I've really enjoyed studying Claiborne for quite a while, but I felt I got to get him to know the person who Claiborne was a little bit better. You know, I discovered that he's very much an introvert. He was that, you know, guy that was always really, really quiet, didn't really talk a lot. Um, you know, didn't, I don't think he liked to be the center of attention, um, but he was a great soldier an amazing commander um but just the thing i came with from him is he was like this quiet quiet guy that you know you wouldn't mm -hmm. I mean you know just very i don't know not not an extrovert not not like his best friend william j hardy no but the thing about him is you know as, as much as he's kind of romantic in a way he's also somewhat polarizing too mm -hmm. you know many many do feel that he's you know for every person who says he's a very underrated general in the american civil war there are definitely those who feel that his career was over embellished and kind of takes away from the efforts of other men who probably mm -hmm. equally deserve it but regardless at the end of the day the life of patrick claiborne is one that absolutely deserves a deep dive and one that is really worthy you know of study so so who was this guy mary so he is born on march 16th 1828 um, at a place called Bride Park. That was what his father and mother called the home, which is nine miles from Cork in Ireland. So he's from County Cork. He's the third child of Joseph and Mary Ann Claiborne. Her maiden name was Ronane, and that's where the where his where his middle name comes from. And that's what he is called when he's growing up. He's not called Patrick. 
he's mm-hmm. called by his middle name when he's growing up. And that was something I discovered in doing this research. Apparently it's more well known than, you know, like when I went to tell you about it, you were like, oh yeah, I knew that kind of thing. Um, but the interesting thing um, about Claiborne's family is that they are not Irish Catholics. They are Irish Protestants. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit, yeah. a little bit here in a second. Cause I think it's important to understand that, you know, we did the episode last, last time about the Irish brigade guys like Michael Corcoran and Thomas Marr and those guys. And, and this Claiborne's different. He's not the, the poor Irish Catholic farmer no. who came across. So we're going to talk about that, you know, and you mentioned before, you know, he's born on March 16th. Um, and there's some debate. Some people will write down these born on March 17th. But his, this mom might wrote, on St. Patrick's Day. his mom right. wrote in the family Bible. It was the 16th. And he's like, He's born into, I don't know if I want to say privilege, but he's not uh, poor. Like he's he, born into privilege. He he is. Like he's a yeah, pro- he like is. his father's a Protestant, his father's a Whig. He's a professional. He's a doctor. They have money. His dad had went to Trinity College in Dublin. He'd moved to County Cork in 1822, where he met Marianne, Claiborne's mother. And she is described as a woman of strong, independent character a radical in politics, a defender of the oppressed, mm. and a friend to liberty and equality. So she's a very strong woman. And as we'll see, unfortunately, Patrick, or Ronane, as he's called when he lives in Ireland, does not like does not get to know his mother very well at all. No, I mean, he, he's you're absolutely right. Now, you mentioned before, you know, the privilege. He was more into privilege. His father, mm-hmm. Joseph, was a successful doctor. And he was a member of that Protestant Anglo-Irish upper class. And he was a landowner in Tipperary County. I mean, he was. And, mm-hmm. and you know, so to, to understand Patrick's early years, and I'm going to call him Patrick because I'm just mm-hmm. kind of confused if I call him Ronane. Mm-hmm. It's important to understand that social structure in Ireland at the time that a lot of people don't really study. You know, just, you know, despite the, the Irish stereotypes, you know, not everybody from Ireland was a perma-drunk Catholic farmer with red hair and anger okay. issues, Maury. Those are more Canadians than what? Irish, okay? But but during the 1800s, you know, there were really three distinct cultures, you know, mm-hmm. in Ireland. You know, first there was that traditional poor Catholic, you know, farmer class who suffered badly during the Great Potato Famine of the 1840s and early 1850s, which led across, led, of course, to that migration into the United States, right? Next were a group called the Uber Scots. Now, these are these are Irish who, who emigrated from Scotland, and they represented a large population of Ireland's lower middle class, that worker class. Mm-hmm. That's who these people were. Last were the Anglo-Irish. Now, these are descendants, like you said, of Protestant um, aristocrat ascendancy, and mm-hmm. many of whom consider themselves to be more British than Irish. Yeah. You know, Arthur Wellesley. Sure, you know who he is, Mary. He's the first Duke of Wellington. You know, many associate him with being British, but he's actually born in Dublin. Yeah. Bram Stoker, Dracula fame. He was Anglo-Irish. People think of him as British. He was born in Ireland as well. Mm-hmm. Now, this Anglo-Irish were, were the privileged class of Ireland, and they were and it was within this privileged class that the Claiborne family was part of. You know, as a matter of fact, Mary, Patrick's great-great-grandfather was William Claiborne who was the Lord of St. John Manor in County Wexford in the late 1600s. So this, there's some history to these people. Yeah. The Claiborne's were, uh, quotation fingers, Irish, but they considered themselves Anglo-Irish. And it's, and it's an important distinction you know, compared to those many Irish soldiers that we talked about last week and who yeah. will later continue to fight in this American Civil War. Now, you mentioned a little bit of his childhood, October 18th, 1829. You know, Patrick was about a year and a half old, 18 months or so, his mother Mary is going to die after giving birth to his younger brother Joseph, mm-hmm. uh, Joseph Jr., leaving his father Joseph as a widower, mm-hmm. right? And he's going to find love pretty quick. He's going yep. to remarry. Well, that uh, was the time, way it was back then. You right, had to. It was. <laughs> mm-hmm. But this time, uh, it's going to be to a Protestant Scot named Isabella Stewart, mm-hmm. who will basically, in essence, be kind of Patrick's mother, and she will be a huge impact on his life growing up. Yeah, she um like she basically becomes his mother. Um, and he's only, you know, he's just over two years old when he, you know, when she comes into his life. And he's gonna refer to her as mama for the rest of his life. And he even asks for her advice into adulthood. Um, yeah. and Patrick's father, Joseph and Isabella, are gonna have four children together. They're gonna have Isabella, who was born in 1832, Edward, who was born in 1833. Robert in 1837 and Christopher, who is called Kit, 
1841. And Kit is going to come back into this episode closer to the end as well. Well, now, a little bit. The, the, the Claiborne family, they, you know, they're very well to do. And they lived in a 200 acre estate called the Grange Farm, where Joseph had a private medical practice as well as he was a staff doctor at the local hospital. Now, now, since they had money, Patrick benefited from getting an excellent education. And he had his own private tutor. Yep. And then when he reached age 12, uh, he's going to enroll is at a private school called the Church of Ireland Reverend William Spedding Boarding School. Sounds like a fun place to be. Yeah, I don't think it was he, very fun. I don't think so either. <laughs> and this is where he's going to be in his teens. Now, here's the thing. As a student, you know, Patrick did okay. He, he loved classes like history, mathematics, you know, your favorite, right? Yeah. But he hated studying foreign languages, especially Latin and especially Greek. And we're going to talk about how that's going to come back and bite you in the butt eventually, right? Mm-hmm. But in 1843, Patrick's life is going to hit a significant bump. And, and this is when his father is going to be treating one of his patients. He's going yep. to catch typhus from him and he's going to die. Right. Patrick is eight, about 15 years old yep. at this point. And this is when he's going to make that decision, you know, to leave school and follow his father's footsteps in medicine. And he will become an apprentice at a local apothecary. Yeah, And it also made Patrick very emotionally distant at times from people like the death of his father had a huge impact on him. Like prior to this growing up, um, one of his cousins said that, you know, as a kid, Claiborne was full of mischief and fun, somewhat shy and dreamy with strangers, but at times he could be really domineering. After his father passed away when he was 15, Claiborne became very, that's kind of when he becomes, he starts to become really, really introverted. Um, and that part of his personality and this kind of like how he's, I, I guess, emotionally withdrawn carries into the American Civil War, as we're going to see as well. Um, But he tries to do this um, medical apprenticeship, but because he doesn't have the languages, it really is a struggle for him. Yeah, he's going to basically be an intern for a couple of years, and he's going to really use that internship to prepare to be admitted to to medical school. Mm -hmm. 1846, he's going to apply to Apothecary Hall, which is part of the Trinity Medical School in Dublin, uh, Dublin, now the University of Dublin. But he's going to get rejected, Mary. Mm -hmm. He's going to get the old turndown. And he's going to be denied because he doesn't know how to read Latin nor Greek, which he hated in prep school. See, again, kids, listen to your high school teachers. They know what they're talking about. Take Latin and Greek. (laughs) But but, but he didn't like it. He didn't study it. And so when he went for his exam, you know, he he flunked out. Now, this is going to be a major traumatic event for him. And considering he's the son of the, you know, of the, the, of the Dr. Joseph Claiborne, you know, yep. the aristocratic doctor, you know, he was embarrassed and he actually felt that this brought shame upon the entire family. So 1846, Claiborne is going to have a choice to make. He could accept the job offer at the Dublin DQ, which they offered him a position, <laughs> okay, DQ. or he, he could enlist in the military. And of course, he's going to choose to join the British Army. Again, we're not talking about the Irish, we're talking about the British Army here. He was hoping to be part of the British Army and get sent to India. But instead, he was assigned to join the 40, 41st Regiment of Foot and was sent to Mullingar, Ireland mm-hmm. because of the of that but that growing potato family we yeah. talked about. They kept him, they kept him local. But here's the thing, Mary. Being a part of the prestigious Claiborne family and, and that Anglo-Irish descendancy, Patrick could have obtained an officer's commission in the army. But you know what yeah. he did? He hid his family lineage and, yeah. and, and he signed as a private. So he could he went to basically becoming a grunt when he kind of didn't have to. He wanted to remain anonymous. He also lied about his age to get into the British Army, which is something, too. I mean, he was it wasn't that bad. He was about to turn 18, but he was 17 when he was enlisted, as you said, he lies about his profession, says he was a laborer. Um, and the regiment's motto was death before shame. So that's uh, interesting as well that he's enlisting in um, a regiment that has that. And they were actually like, they were also known as the Welsh regiment too. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you said, yeah, they're supposed to go to India to fight in the first Sikh war and they don't. And like I said, he just wants to be anonymous at this point doesn't want to flout what he has anything like that yeah so you know he's he's in this army and while he's in the british army he really you know he took the soldiering very very well and he loved yeah. it he loved the discipline he received 
And he really, he, he you know, as well as he really took a shine to that British model of how to drill effectively. He was paying mm-hmm. attention. He was basically the model soldier in his life with that 30, 41st Regiment of Foot clearly built that foundation of what is going to show later on in his, in his soldier life. Yeah, you can and, really see how, you know, being in the British Army is shaping him for what he's going to be like in the, the Civil War. Yeah. And, and it was, like we said, it was during this time in the British Army when that great potato, potato famine was really mm-hmm. striking at its hardest. And it began that mass exodus from, from the country. Now, you know, millions of poor Irish died or either left for America. And even though, like we said, Claiborne was not a member of the poor Irish, the farmer class, he wasn't directly a part of it. The famine still hit his family really hard and they suffered substantial financial ruin. I mean, it, it, it did. And it got it got to the point that, you know, despite really enjoying his new life in the army, you know, Patrick Claiborne knew that for the betterment of his family, you know, it was time it was time to get a step in. It was time to leave yeah. Ireland. So like so many did to leave to America. So September 22nd of 1849, Claiborne's going to use his family inheritance that he had to basically buy his way out of the British army yeah. to get discharged for his for service is, is what he did. And he's going to scoot. He's going to go along with his older sister, Anne, and his brothers, William and Joseph. They're going to board a boat called the Bridgetown, and mm-hmm. they're going to leave Ireland for good. And they're going to, going to get to New Orleans two months later in November of 1849. Um, but they didn't stay there too long, probably because they missed Mardi Gras. Yep. They had no reason to stick <laughs> around. So what do they do, Mary? From New Orleans, they're going to get on the boat, and they're going to sail up the Mississippi River. And on Christmas Day, 1849, the Claiborne's are going to arrive in the lovely town of Cincinnati, Ohio, Mary, which is going to be their new home. Yeah. And it is the second largest city in the American West at the what is considered the American West at the time. Um, and Claiborne found work um, as a clerk in a drugstore. And he's not they're not there for very long um, before he finds out that uh, two young there's two physicians in Hel- Helena, Arkansas or Helena, Arkansas that need a pharmacist to manage their store. And this is going to be probably one of the more significant events in Claiborne's life is this moving to Helena, Arkansas. This is going to be his big social break. You know, he's going to get that opportunity to go down to Helena, Arkansas, it owned by two locals, a guy named Dr. Charles Nash and Hector Grant. Now mm-hmm. in Helena, Nash and Grant really, really enjoyed Claiborne and, and they both went yeah. out of their way So not only help them get a job, but also assimilate into that social structure, you know, of the town. He's new to town. He's, you know, he's, he's not from the United States. So he's, you know, these guys really helped him out. Well, he describes the town as I found a quote where Claiborne describes the town. And it reminds me of that one from Star Wars where it's like, you'll never find a more, you know, scum and villainy or whatever. He said, Helena, Arkansas was the haunt of the most reckless, desperate characters in the Mississippi Valley, a place where pistol and bowie knife decided every quarrel. So he is coming into this like, whoa, Mm -hmm. this is quite the place I'm, you know, I'm joining. And as you said, he's, you know, he begins to be assimilated into the town and Nash and and Grant really help him out. He has room and board for and gets paid $50 a month for this pharmacy. And he's very enthusiastic in his job. Uh, yes, I mean, and Nash and Grant they they enjoyed they enjoyed him, but they also had a lot of mm-hmm. fun with him. They hazed him a little bit, you know. Oh, yeah. the, the, he's he's the new guy, you know. There was that story when you know Patrick Claiborne, being from Ireland, had never seen a watermelon before, yep. of all things, and he had no idea how to eat it. So Nash and Grant told him the only way to eat a watermelon, Patrick, is to cut it into pieces, yep. boil it. And something that Claiborne goes, well, okay, sounds good. And that's what he did. And they all get a big laugh as he boiled up. They boiled the watermelon and they ate it with spoons out of a bowl. And and basically, basically probably because he was embarrassed by the watermelon incidents, um, but he was cool with it. You know, Claiborne, again, continued to earn praise by his bosses. And they really appreciated his work ethic, how hard he worked. Mm -hmm. His work ethic was, was so, it so impressed Dr. Nash that when Grant, decided to sell his share of the business, he gave Claiborne a loan to help buy him, buy out Grant's yep. share and become part owner of this pharmacy. You know, something Claiborne absolutely appreciated and it drove him to work even harder. Claiborne became the man about town. And as, as they say, and 
he he took this opportunity to feel like he belonged. Yeah. So he really, you know, he really became very active in the local social circles, right? And yeah. He, I was going to say, he also breaks away from that Irish stereotype, which he sees when he gets to America and he sees it in Helena too. You know, there's Irish jokes in the paper everywhere, um, you know, whether they be about a drunken Irishman or whatever. Um, but the one thing to mention about Claiborne is that um, he does drink socially at first, but very quickly stops because uh, Nash put it best when he said, instead of making Claiborne jovial, it made him angry and, as he said, crazy. And after one drinking bout, the last drinking bout that Claiborne ever had, Claiborne threatened to kill Nash for waking him up. And after that, he he just didn't. And he also didn't want to he also didn't want to embody that, um, you know, that Irish stereotype. But for somebody who's like described as um, like I read one description of Claiborne where it was said his face was often like that of the Sphinx. Like you couldn't really tell what emotion he had. Like when he drank, it just, it changed him completely. He was an angry drunk. Well, it's probably one of the groups he joined in Helena was the temperance club. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. that he, and that's where he joined 1852. He's going to join the Lafayette lodge number 16 and become a Freemason. And he's going to quickly rise to a leadership position in the lodge by 1853, uh, Claiborne will be elected master of the lodge, and soon after, he will be he will receive the prestigious sublime degree of Royal Arch Mason in a ceremony that was conferred on him by future Confederate General Albert Pike, mm -hmm. who was an A-lister in the Freemasonry world to, you know, to this day. Uh, so this is who he's becoming. He's rising in the social network to a point when he's he's really becoming a leader. So in less than four years, Claiborne has gone from quitting the British Army heading to America to becoming a part owner of a business and a well-respected citizen leader in Helena. And this just goes to show that the, the contrast between the experiences of the Irish New York City and Boston yeah. and Philly, it just really shows when you, when you study him, you realize it's night and day. Helena, Arkansas, you know, in the South for in general, became Patrick Claiborne's true home now. Yeah. And not Ireland. And he continued to climb in social circles as the town grew from a small town to a much bigger city, right? Mm -hmm. So 1854, Claiborne decides to move on from that pharmacy and chase a career in law, which was always his dream, apparently. Listen, mm -hmm. dreamt about it while he was sleeping in Latin class, right? But that's what he, what he wanted to do. But he became involved in local politics too. Now you mentioned a little while ago, he was a Whig, right? But when yeah. that party fell apart, he joined the Democratic Party as an alternate because the Know Nothing Party that was big at the time, and we mentioned last time, they're very anti-immigrant. Yeah. And because of you know his foreign blood, he just couldn't possibly imagine signing up for something like that. So he yeah. became well, he became a Democrat. He will pass the bar in 1856. You know, a former law partnership with another young, an up and coming hooligan in Helen, Helena, named Thomas C. Hinman. We talked yes. about. You Hinman's could not a, ask for two opposites. Well, I mean, yes two. and no. They were Hinman, they were both Democrats, and Hinman was a, into politics too. Mm -hmm. Hinman was running for Congress in the first Arkansas district in 1856, and Claiborne supported him, helped him out. I don't know if he knocked on doors or what he did, but he was helping <laughs> Hinman. And it was around this time Claiborne's going to become a U.S. citizen too. Yes. And Claiborne is going to also become friends with another local named Lucius Polk, of mm -hmm. all people. And, and he'll have a long Civil War history too as well. But uh, Claiborne is going to learn the dark side of American politics around this point. You know, Hinman's going to end up losing that race. He, he's not going to win right away uh, for Congress. But during the campaign, he got into a Twitter feud with a guy named, he was a know nothing legislator. It was a newspaper feud. Yeah, I know. I know. With, a, with, a guy, with a guy named W.D. Rice. And maybe him and forgot to state his sources. We don't know. But it pissed off Rice very, very badly, right? No, on, <laughs> on May 24th of 1856, while they were out in town doing their thing, Claiborne and Hinman found themselves getting ambushed on the street yeah. by Hinman's rival. This guy, Rice, along with three of Rice's relatives, they just jumped him. Yeah. And the, the altercation became violent when Rice and his men pulled out their guns and they just started blasting. Right? Yeah. They started shooting. <laughs> and, and, and Hinman and Claiborne are both going to get hit. Claiborne's going to be hit her seriously. Yeah. He'll be shot in the lung, but Claiborne's going to fire back. So he was packing heat too. Yeah. He's going to kill one of Rice's relatives. 
Hinman's life was, I mean, Clement, uh, Claiborne's life was actually life, life threatening. It was about 10, of... 10 days that his life was kind yeah. of hanging there because Hinman, you know, they looked at him and they're like, the bullet had passed through his right lung and then lodged near his spine. And they were like, well, we don't know if we can do surgery on him or not. So for 10 days, it was like touch and go with him. Um, but eventually the bullet was found and removed and Claiborne recovered, uh, but he was never quite the same after that. And he wrote to his brother, Robert, my lungs have never been the same since I was wounded. I catch a cold on the smallest provocation and an hour's excited debate in the courthouse will sometimes fill my mouth with blood. Um, so he's not quite the same after this happens to oh. him. Um, and the best part of that story, neither Cl Claiborne nor him and get charged. No, nope, they were nothing. exonerated okay. by a grand jury. Imagine, I mean, yeah, I mean, you get convicted. I mean, imagine shooting yeah. a politician. <laughs> it's yeah. a different world back Well, then. just it sounds like, I mean, the way he describes Helena as being this kind of like, it's like the Wild West. And it was clearly like from his description, something that he had never, you know, it's like, whoa, this place is like, it's crazy. No, talking about, it. but the thing about it, this was going to be really the, the, the really cementing of the friendship between Claiborne and Hidman, mm -hmm. and, and, and it won't be long where Hidman's going to get married to Mary Watkins Bisco in 1856, and Claiborne, of course, will be his best man. And you know, Hidman, you know, ironically, he Hidman did finally win that congressional seat a couple of years yeah. later, 1858, and he began his political career as a pro, very pro-slavery candidate uh, as a congressman right from the beginning, 1859. Um, for the most part is when he took office. But again, it was the important election of 1860 on the horizon mm. that was that where all the rumors were starting because that's when the rumors of secession were really picking up in the South, right? So with this talk of secession and possible war in the air, Claiborne is going to use his social weight to raise a local militia. He will raise a company called the Yell Rifles, which is named after Arkansas Governor Archibald Yeld. Mm -hmm. And and just like he did with the, as he learned in the experience in the British Army, when you know he, he's going to join as a private, but quickly he'll be made a, a captain pretty quick. They're going to know who he is yeah. here. So 1860, he's going to be the, he's going to be running that company. But despite being somewhat, you know, like you said, shy and kind of aloof to those yeah. meeting him, Claiborne was still the obvious choice, you know, to to lead this Leader. company. Yep. He was smart. He was popular. He was a high ranking Freemason. He was the guy plugged in to Helena's social scene, so he, of course, you know, of course, he was going to he was going to get that gig, right? And he was the rare type of, of people who was loved by almost everyone in town, you know, both by the rich and the poor. Claiborne, like we said, by a lot of these people, he said he he had he's that natural leader, yeah, and, and someone and everyone in town just really respected. That's well, just who, who who he was, and he's involved in so much in town besides you know the Freemasons. He's in the debating society, he forms the first chess club in Helena, Arkansas, where he's the president, too. So he's kind of got that nerdy aspect to him as well. And as you said, he's part of the temperance society, so he's very well known. And then there's like the politics, owning the store. I mean, if you're a store owner, you're going to be uh, well known as well. But then there's also being a lawyer. So he's come a long way. And when you contrast that with, you know, the episode we did last week, that some of these Irish are here, they're joining up in the Civil War. And they want to take back what they're going to learn in the army, take back, take it back to Ireland. Claiborne never has any intention of going back to Ireland at all. Oh, this we said this was his home now. He, he was described as looking as Irish as St. Patrick O'Flinipo, and but talks <laughs> with a without a Hiberian accent. Interesting, mm -hmm. right? They said he stood about five foot eleven. His hair was originally very dark black, but as he got older, steadily toward turn more gray welcome aboard yep. but the thing about it though is you know, you know he was he was irish but he was based on his anglo-irish upper class background you know who attended private schools and came from money you know he, he avoided a lot of that anti-irish stigma i mean he got it a little bit but he yep. didn't get it as much as the irish immigrants did like we said other parts of the country and, and so he when when this is all going down he's looked to as as, as a leader the governor of Arkansas at the time, a guy named Henry Massey Rector, you know, they're debating um, about the states to, to, to decide about secession or not. And they're trying to decide. And, you know, um, Rector was very, very, very clear in his record of slavery. You know, he absolutely was. At the state's emergency convention held on March 2nd, 1861, Governor Rector, he, he said the area of slavery must be extended. 
The North believes slavery is a sin. We do not. And therein lies the trouble. Mm-hmm. Pretty, pretty cut and dry right there, right? Yep. So, so by the time of the firing at Fort Sumter, you know, Claiborne is a successful lawyer, a militia captain, and one who neither no, owned slaves nor supported slavery or had an opinion. Just that's just didn't he care, didn't right? really. I mean, he doesn't have an opinion on it at all. But no, but the, after the firing of Fort Sumter, though, and Abraham Lincoln's request of 750 troops from Arkansas to put down the rebellion, Claiborne very much supported yes. Arkansas's decision yep. to become the ninth state to secede when they seceded from the Union on May 6th of 1861. Claiborne said of it, his quote about it was, the North is about to wage a brutal and unholy war on people who have, done, have not done them wrong in violation of the Constitution and the fundamental principles of government. So he's basically, I mean, he, they, they, I mean, he goes and he continues, they no longer acknowledge that the government derives its validity from the consent of the governed. So he's drawn his battle lines very clearly. He doesn't mm-hmm. care so much about slavery, but he's very much into these guys are screwing us here and we're going to yeah. fight for, you know, we're going to fight for a right to party. That's yeah. kind of what, he, what he's thinking, right? So his yell rifles at this point, they're going to get absorbed into the first Arkansas regiment and he'll be elected colonel of the regiment. Mm-hmm. And they were sent to a place called Pittman's Ferry for garrison duty. This is in the summer of 61 along a river called the Current River. Um, later in October 62, Mary, there's going to be a skirmish at, at the uh, at Pittman's Ferry. You know what they called it? The skirmish at Pittman's Ferry. I was ever creative. Yep. Right? <laughs> but anyway, but anyway the, the, the first Arkansas, for the most part, will be in a brigade mm-hmm. by a guy you mentioned named William J. Hardy, right? Yep. A guy that the Arkansas men called Old Reliable. Yep. That was the nickname they called him, okay? And, and this will be the beginning of a long friendship between Patrick Claiborne and William Hardy. Yeah. And they were very much opposites. Like, you know, Hardy is often described as dressing like a dandy. He's, you know, got kind of the best clothes and and Claiborne is often said to like, you know, once he, you know, it's going to be a little bit before he gets this, but even when he became like a major general, he, he still dressed like a private, you know, like you couldn't really tell he just, and and Hardy often made fun of him for that, that, you know, Claiborne just didn't dress as well. And it was kind of embarrassing if, Hardy ran into some women and there's Pat Claiborne on his side and he's just kind of oh, yeah. bumbling along, you know, oh, there's, there's definitely there's stories like that. Yeah. I mean, but Hardy was, was a military celebrity though, before, yeah. before the, in the U S he Army. had that book, right? Hardy's tactics. He re- literally wrote the book on tactics that both armies use. And, and it was a, the best known drill manual of the civil mm-hmm. war. Um, but, you know, not just Claiborne, but, but, you know, the, the that they seemingly all the men of the regiment really admired Hardy. It wasn't just Patrick. It was all mm-hmm. of them. He trained his men really hard. He kept his men fed well. Uh, he kept them well supplied. You know, he was a, he was a good leader. But of all, of all the Arkansas men, you know, it was Claiborne who really appreciated the drilling that Hardy did. And this goes back to England or back to Ireland yep. again. And this is the thing he really enjoyed back with that 30, 41st regiment of foot. Mm-hmm. So um, with Hardy's blessing and experience, Claiborne continued to drill his own regiment really, really hard as he saw fit. And quickly, his regiment, um, that originally called the 1st Arkansas, it really became a really strong and well-trained regiment very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. So by the fall of 1861, when Hardy's brigade joined Albert Sidney Johnson's Army of Central Kentucky, this is by March 4th, 1862, Hardy was so impressed with Claiborne that he promoted him to brigadier, to brigadier general after Hardy himself was promoted to division commander. So he's, again, just like in Helena, he's seeing his military career now really, really pick up. And this is around the time of the first Arkansas. They Someone realized there are two first Arkansas somehow. Yeah, so they become they changed, the 15th. They become the 15th. I don't know how the hell that happens, but I don't think drew straws or what the hell they did but probably but like me old, unable to do math and count well, probably claiborne's old regiment is now the 15th arkansas so you'll start to see that and continue uh, claiborne's going to continue to drill his men hard now he's now he's got a full brigade and and he's going to see his first action when his men raided south central kentucky where he freaked out the commander of that area mary a yeah. guy named william t sherman yeah who was going to he was going to end up being the bane of, of Sherman's existence off and on throughout the war here. Claiborne was aggressive and it was noticed by just about everybody how he was. You know, by then, Forts Henry and Donaldson have fallen to U.S. Yeah. grants. 
Um, Claiborne finds himself in, in Corinth, Mississippi, with the 2nd Brigade, which included the, the 15th Arkansas, his old regiment, the 6th Mississippi, the 2nd, 23rd, and 24th Tennessee, and the 35th Tennessee, the 5th Provisional, including the Helena Artillery. Mm-hmm. So this is who, who his men are at the time. The brigade, um, ironically, the, the guy who ran the 1st Brigade right next door was guess who? Thomas Inman. Yeah. So he's, he's right there by his side as well. And we're not going to spend too, too much time about how, how these battles go. But when March turned to April, Claiborne's left wing marched north towards Pittsburgh Landing, Tennessee. And soon they were preparing to launch an attack on Union forces on April 6th of 1862. And the thing is, you know, early in the morning, Claiborne's brigade, with they're on the left, and they're part of that first wave, and they're going to run into the Union 5th Division, again, under the command of Sherman, yep. near Shiloh Church. Yep, right. and this is going to be the Battle of Shiloh, um, right. and we did, I think, a couple episodes on Shiloh. Yeah, we're not going to spend too, too much time. When... This, this, yeah. this will go, go all night with it, like Lionel Richie all night long. He's not talking <laughs> right. about Shiloh in detail. But I mean, the thing about it is, is again, Claiborne's men, they're, they're vicious, they're relentless, and, they, and really they're going to lead the attack when and really successfully push Sherman's men eventually back towards Pittsburgh mm-hmm. Landing. And, and again, by nightfall, the Union Army under Grant is pushed right back to the Tennessee River. In the Battle of Shiloh, it looks like a complete Confederate victory until Don Carlos Buell's army, the Ohio, yeah. was going to well, Beauregard tells Jeff Davis, hey, yeah. I think we got ourselves a victory here. <laughs> yeah. Buell's guys arrive, and, and, and it ends up being a lot different. The next day, the 7th, while well, the Union men are driving, because they're, they're counterattacking now, yeah. Claiborne and his men are again in the lead. This time they're flying, they're they're commanding the rebel, uh, basically re- rebel counterattacks, and then you're flying that unique blue flag, right? The yep. blue flag with the white circle, which will be known as Hardy's The one flag. behind me right now. Right. And that flag is going to become synonymous with vicious fighting as, as the war goes on. Yep. And, you know, everyone knows the story of how Shiloh ends, but Claiborne's, Claiborne's brigade suffers a, has a thousand losses. Yeah, it's not a 2,700 men, 37% casualties, which is going to be the, represent the highest casualty percentage in any Confederate brigade at, at, at the Battle of Shiloh. So, again, this is their really baptism by fire for a lot of these guys. And they're right up front on both days and they get whacked, but they keep fighting. Yeah, it's not. It's definitely not his greatest day in the Civil War, but as we're going to see, he does learn from it. After the battle, General Hardy will say of him, Brigadier General Claiborne conducted his command with persevering valor. No repulse, to sc- no, no repulse discouraged him, but after many bloody struggles, he assembled the remnant of his brigade and was conspicuous for his gallantry to the end of the battle. Um, and he, you know, like I said, it's not his best day, but he is going to learn from this and improve upon it and that becomes evident as the battles go on and on he's going to double down when the army goes to corinth mississippi yeah and 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 for the most part when when the union army is advancing which is going to result in the first battle of corinth that's going to end on may 30th of 1862 you know he's going to help basically be the speed bump to help the army escape yeah and be that caboose that's going to keep the union away which is going to be kind of foreshadowing of some things that are going to come later on with him uh, so really you know by by this point i mean people of the army who is this claiborne guy i mean this guy whatever he does by the, yeah. by the summer of 62 claiborne's brigade is going to get assigned to edmund kirby, uh, kirby smith's army in kentucky mm-hmm. and they're going to participate in those raids in the southeastern kentucky but in this situation, this is August 29th of 1862, Claiborne is going to be put in temporary division command now. And yeah. when he's going to when he's going to command a large provisional division, uh, brigades of Preston Smith and Benjamin Hill at the Battle of Richmond, right? Yeah. And and again, here Claiborne is going to act aggressively. He's going to lead his men to Kool-Aid the man through the <laughs> Union line. They're going, to, they're going to burst right through the through the, of the Union Army. And when it's over. Claiborne has his fingerprints all over the most lopsided Confederate, Confederate victory of the war as Bull Nelson's Union Army lost 5,300 men to Kirby Smith's 400, a full metal pantsing. Yeah. And Claiborne was a big part of that. Yeah, except he is not there to see the end part of it because um, at one point he goes over to his Lucius Polk gets wounded and he goes over to him because they're, they're very good friends. Make sure he's okay. And as Claiborne is opening his mouth to say, Oh, I'm glad you're okay. Something to that effect. 
um, a mini ball pierces his left cheek, smashes two of his teeth um, on his bottom jaw and just exits his mouth. And Claiborne will later joke that he caught the ball in his mouth and spat it out. So he ends up getting wounded. Um, he tries to stay on the field for a while, um, but he start, his mouth starts swelling up. He gets filled with blood. And finally, someone is like, dude, like two, you need to go to the rear. Um, you need to be stitched up. You can't be here. So he's unable to see um, what he's done at Richmond, but it doesn't go unnoticed. One thing that I do want to mention that Claiborne does with his men before Richmond and just after Shiloh, and this does help contribute, this helps with what happened at Richmond, is that he recognizes that warfare has definitely changed from that Napoleonic style tactic. What he saw at Shiloh was basically like you're bushwhacking, you're not doing Napoleonic style warfare. And he realizes that if he had sharpshooters, it would be a lot more effective um, and could turn the outcome in the battle to his advantage. So mm -hmm. he discusses this idea with his officers um, and he explains to the rank and file what he's going to do. And the best five shots from each company would be detached to form a special company of sharpshooters. And they would be deployed in advance of the brigade as skirmishers. They're going to be used to outflank um, the enemy um, or to shoot down enemy gun gunners who are working on artillery pieces. And he explained these reasons even to the rank and file soldiers so that they would understand. And again, this goes back to how good of a leader Claiborne is, is he's wanting them to understand, this is why I'm having you do this. Um, but the other thing, too, is these shooting contests, you know, in that kind of lull between Corinth and um, and Richmond, it gives them something to do. It's an activity. You know, they can have competitions. Mm -hmm. um, it helps to improve their morale. So he has these sharpshooters with him now going into the Battle of Richmond. And like I said, he's unable to see the end of what he does because he gets wounded. But Richmond shows how much Claiborne had matured in those few months since Shiloh. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a victory. As you said, it's one of the most lopsided ones for the Confederates. And Claiborne is a huge reason for that. It was, but he got shoved, like, breaks five teeth, it goes through his mouth. And he's, you know, and he's going to have to rehab for a month, but he's going to rejoin his command on September 21st. Uh, but again, back as a brigade commander, that that mm -hmm. division thing was just temporary. That, that whole thing got, got, you know, it was provisional, got dissolved. Um, but like I said, while while the army was gone, the army is going to consolidate with General Braxton Bragg's Army mm -hmm. of Tennessee back in Lexington, Kentucky, you know, before being driven out again by Don Carlos Buell's army. OK, but October 8th, you know, Bragg is going to reform and he'll attack Buell. It will be known as the Battle of Perryville. But Claiborne's already back at this point, leading his brigade. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie to you, Mary. If I got shot in the face at work, I'm, I'm milking that. I'm taking time. He's like, I'm nope, not, I'm I'm coming back. I mean, it's a month, right? And Perryville, a Claiborne is again going to be aggressive. He'll be wounded two more times, and it will be a really a strong performance by Bragg, actually, outnumbered three to one. But he's going to successfully push Buell back before exiting Kentucky altogether back to Na Knoxville, Tennessee. Yep. In the end, we, we, we did an episode on this. In the end, Bragg is going to give up to Kentucky for whatever reason. And is that key border state we talked about, and the you, Confederacy will never get it back again. And many of you, many of you, Perryville, this guy included as one of the big turning points of the war, Mary, if you really yeah. think about it. When you study Perryville, under, it really is. It, it's, it's very underrated, you know, but despite being wounded again, you know, Claiborne is going to continue to play a very important role in Bragg's retreat from Perryville to Knoxville. And, and this is the story where they're retreating. It's rainy, it's muddy, it's crappy. Yeah. And, 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 and all the roads are very difficult to get by. Claiborne's wounded again, and he's riding in the back of the ambulance, which is where the supply trains were. Now, they all knew how critical, important these supply wagons were, and under no circumstances could they be lost. And again, due to the weather, the roads, to the proximity of a much larger Union army, they were very, very vulnerable. But despite being injured, you know, Claiborne's going to take command on his own initiative to make sure these supply trains get through safely. And it's not going to be the only time he does that, but he's that he's going to save Bragg's trains for the most part. Yep. And so by the time that Bragg's army is going to regroup again near Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Claiborne's reputation of an all-around solid commander has reached the Confederate White House in Richmond. So what happens? December 13th, President Jefferson Davis, Mary, is going to personally promote Patrick Claiborne to major general. 
and Claiborne's going to get his own division again, but this time on a yeah. permanent basis. Now, the thing about it, his division is going to be in William Hardy's second corps, yeah. the Army of Tennessee, and it's going to include his former brigade, which is now commands up by Helena friend Lucius Polk, mm-hmm. as well as brigades under uh, St. John R. Liddell, Bushrod Johnson, and the great Sterling A.M. Woodmary, a man known to rise to every early situation, right? So Johnson now, and Wood are the same. Johnson and Wood, <laughs> yeah, first, you know. But the thing about the whether he knew it or not, at that very moment, Patrick Claiborne was now the highest ranking Irish born general in American military history mm-hmm. at that very moment. And, and this is the situation now going into the end of 1862. Right now, we're not going to spend more time talking about the battles and this and that. But the but the Army of the Cumberland with forty three thousand men is led by his new commander William Rosecrans, yeah. who is in the process of advancing from Nashville towards Bragg's position along the Stones River near Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And, and again, we're not going to go into too many details of the battle, but but seeing Rose seeing Rosecrans men set to attack on the morning of twelve thirty one. Bragg, despite only having 35,000 men, decides he's going to attack first. Now, yep. Claiborne, yet again, is going to be put in front in his orders, and he orders his new division now to, to forward, and they'll hit the Union right flank against Jefferson C. Davis's division, and it's going to drive them back all the way on route to the Nashville Turnpike. Now, he'll pursue these, these, running, these running Federals, but for some reason, who knows, the effort was slow this time, was disjointed. It just, yep. it just didn't work out. He'll run into the third division under fun-loving Phil Sheridan, Mary. Oh, my as well favorite. As, as, really. as, well as, uh, as well as Louis Rousseau's first division in an area called the, tri- the, the Slaughter mm-hmm. Pen, which is a natural defensive area of trees and rocks, etc. But Claver, once again, is going to get the feds to fall back. And he has enough steam for maybe one more push, right? And if he sees the Nashville Turnpike, it's the Union supply line back to Nashville. And he's just about there. He's almost there when fresh federal troops arrive. And Claiborne again, after losing 33% of his men again, they're going to have to fall back themselves, right? Yeah. And we talked, we did a whole episode on this, but Stones River was an absolute bloodbath. And Bragg's whole army had to fall back to their winter uh, encampment uh, to rest and recover from a brutal 1862 near War Trace, Tennessee, right? Now, Claiborne already had the reputation of being one of the of the most aggressive and smartest generals in the Army of Tennessee. But after Stones River, uh, he knew they needed to get better. Yeah. He, he, re- he really did, right? And they did. Um, you mentioned before the, 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 the sharpshooter situation. Yeah. That, that was improving. They were, they were able to get English Whitworth rifles at this point and, 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 to, and help that, that whole wing of it. And also to promote divisional pride, they kind of stole that blue and white flag and made it their own. Yeah. yeah. So that's mm-hmm. why you see the, the Hardy flag ends up being called the Claiborne flag a lot. Yep. And that, it's, it's at this moment when Claiborne says, that flag, I want that. That's ours. Yeah. And, and he that's, takes it. that's why it becomes known as the flag of Claiborne's division. And right. the other thing, too, with Claiborne becoming a division commander is he has more staff. So this is when you have um, Captain Irving Buck, who you will hear quite a bit. Um, in the history of Patrick Claiborne. If you study him, you're you're going to hear the name Irving Buck. So Buck writes of Claiborne that he is quiet, has little to say, and anyone to see and not know him would take him much sooner for a private than a major general. So again, it goes back to Cl- Claiborne's quiet nature, but Claiborne al- also has a kind of, I don't know, uh, just another side to him, which is kind of fun. Apparently he had at this time a pet raccoon at his headquarters, and it's St. John Liddell who writes about this raccoon that at night the raccoon would try to find someone to share a bid with to keep warm. Uh, sometimes it would get kicked out, but usually someone would take pity on the poor creature and be like, okay, you can you can share my bed tonight. Uh, but Liddell said there was one night everybody seemed unfriendly to him and kept kicking him out. And after trying all the bids, the poor fellow stopped and set up a most pitiable cry. Um, and then someone ended up taking him in for the night. So that is just... Um, one of these stories from Pat Clay, like, you know, about Pat Claiborne that kind of shows this other side that, you know, yeah. the, the division commander has a pet raccoon. I mean, the camp stories with Claiborne are probably the best stories because oh, yeah. we talk about battles and leading the left, all this stuff, but it's the stories, you know, and St. John Liddell, you know, he, he's one of, you know, 
it's around this time, it, all these stories are coming out while they're in this camp in, in the early winter of 63, you know, where Claiborne really helps strengthen that, that odd couple relationship with William Hardy, you know, yeah. St. Saint, Saint John R. Liddell, you know, he, um, you know, he's one of Claiborne's brigade guys. He tells that story of, of the time when he went to visit Claiborne who had ridden off with Hardy and had to wait for him back in camp. Mm-hmm. And, and, and Liddell, he says, when Claiborne came riding back, he was alone, and according to Liddell, in a not tidy appearance. Like you said, he dressed like he dressed like a whatever, like, yep. like a bag, right? Probably dressed like I did in grade nine, plaid. Oh and yeah, jeans. probably. Absolutely, I've seen those pictures. But he, <laughs> but but he also said Claiborne appeared to be pissed off at something, and you heard him say it was about Hardy being late and running after women. And and, and mm-hmm. when Liddell when when Liddell and Claiborne were talking, Hardy Hardy arrives. And he yells as loud as anybody can hear, have you seen anything of my wild Irish general? Yeah. He's yelling, look of a Claiborne, right? Claiborne is pretending to ignore him, and he's just staring in a space trying to fight a smile. Like he can't hear him. Yeah. Everyone's looking at Claiborne, he's like, <laughs> right? And so uh, the, uh, the surgeon of the division, a guy named Dr. Johnson, he yells to Hardy, oh, yeah, General, he's right over here. Come down. He's right here. Yeah. <laughs> right. And Claiborne, of course, is embarrassed when Hardy comes over to him and says to General Claiborne, is it not proper for a subordinate officer invited to ride with a commander to come properly dressed? And Claiborne says, yeah, yes, sir. Right. And then Hardy continues with an earshot of the others. Now, here is Claiborne coming out so badly dressed as to be frightened home at the sight of ladies who happened to meet him on the road. And Claiborne awkwardly responds and, and that he was not prepared to meet the ladies. <laughs> Dr. Hardy and, and uh, Dr. Johnson and Hardy, they go back and forth laughing about Claiborne being embarrassed. And, uh, and, 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 and basically it brought, it brought Claiborne, you know, trying to fight back laughter at this point. And what it does, it, it shows Claiborne's personality where he was brutal in battle but, uh, but he was bashful and sometimes standoffish to those who don't really know him. Yeah. And he had some pe- some very peculiar habits. You mentioned the pet raccoon thing, right? And, and, and is that story where the raccoon runs up the tree afterwards and yeah. someone says, ah, oh, the Yankees will probably treat him better anyway. Let's, let's, yeah. let's leave him alone. <laughs> just leave the uh, poor raccoon. You know, but, but, yeah, but he had a poor raccoon. Um, but both Rosecrans and Brad, you know, you know they, they, they stayed in their camps for the first half of 1863 until the Union began that fantastic Tullahoma campaign we talked about, which basically drove Bragg's army all the way back towards Chattanooga with barely a shot fired. And this is going to be get that cat and mouse game between yeah. Bragg and Rosecrans. Now, in September, September of 1863, when Rosecrans's army was divided, you know, Bragg, who has higher numbers now, because especially he has the arrival of one James Longstreet now mm-hmm. um, from the Army of Northern Virginia, they're going to attack Rosecrans. And September 19th, it'll be, the, it'll be the, basically the second day of what will be the Battle of, Chicka- of Chickamauga. Looking at yep. you, Minty and Wilder, people say it's the first day, but it's yep. the second day, right? Starts on September you know, 18th. And we're not going to talk all about the Battle of Chickamauga again, but again, you know, he's going to launch that attack around dusk and with daylight disappearing. This is Claiborne now. Mm-hmm. His men kind of get spread out and you only see the flashes of the muzzles. And, and his men fought right up until total darkness and only stopped when his men couldn't see anymore. Possible fear of the sighting of the Rosewoods clown maybe had something to do with slowing them down before whatever <laughs> there, reason. There's, his, uh, there's some creepy shit in those woods they, of Chickamauga. They stop, they stop cold. Claiborne's action on September 20th was delayed. He was supposed to attack at dawn, but he didn't get orders till mid morning. And then by, by the time it, it was a it was a big mess. And you know, we're not gonna, like I said, get too too too, too much into this, but at the end of the battle, the Union's gonna get driven back towards Chattanooga. And it's yeah. gonna be a big, big, big victory for Bragg. There is um, one story I have about Claiborne at this battle. Um oh, okay. it's it's more of like a personal it's a it's a story of how he treated a union um there was a lieutenant that was captured from the union side so it's an officer union officer and um he wasn't answering claiborne's questions claiborne's like where are your lines and the guy's like i'm not telling you anything dude um so the staff o- so claiborne's like to a staff officer you take charge of him he's yours um and the staff officer asked the union officer well do you have anything to eat and the lieutenant's like yeah actually i do i've got hardtack and i've got coffee and the staff officer tried to claim it as his prize. The soldiers that captured the officer were like, 
no, that's ours. And they're all sitting by a fire at this point. So Claiborne is hearing the argument as he's sitting by the fire and he gets up from the fire and he walks over to listen to it. And then he finally says like, you know, he said to the officer, like, well, it's your property. Do you want to keep it? And the officer's like, actually, yeah, I would. And Claiborne just looked at him and said, I think that's a very sensible decision you just made. And so the officer gets to keep his food, his hard tack and his coffee. And the officer later recalled that Claiborne was very polite to him. Yeah, Clay, Claiborne was fair. He was tough, but he was fair. No question about that. Um, you know, in his role at Chickamauga, for the most part, you want to say it was nondescript, but he wasn't in the front of the line. He, he, yeah. was, he wasn't like a lot of these other guys. He's not um, in there like, I mean, he's not in there as much as like Longstreet and Hood are in there no. uh, during that breakthrough um, and all that. He's very much, you know, kind of his his night attack is something that Bragg almost does as an afterthought because remember at the Battle of Chickamauga, Bragg has one plan going into it in the morning of the 18th and Minty and Wilder just basically what they do. They make Bragg have to go back to the drawing board and redo everything. So that's why Chickamauga is the battle that it is, is because of that. It, it is. But, you know, following Chickamauga, you know, Bragg is going to send James Longstreet away. He's going to go to Knoxville to fight Amb uh, Ambrose Burnside. And speaking of which, Barry, real quick, sidebar, Colonel Ed Lowe's book is going to be um, discussed on April 16th about yes. this paddle in Knoxville. Knoxville. So, yep. so pay attention to that, okay? But anyway, so, so Rose France is going to basically be set up in Chattanooga, and while Bragg's siege is bearing down on them, and, and, and it seems like things are in control, Bragg will send Claiborne to Knoxville to basically assist Longstreet. And, but he'll get recalled pretty quickly, though. Yeah, he gets, he's Bragg... like pretty much putting his troops on the terrain, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, he wants you to come back, and Claiborne's like, WTF. Well, like, Bragg realizes realize U.S. Grant is, is there, and he's increased yeah. their numbers, and and Grant's going to try to break out of Chattanooga. So he want, you know, he obviously wants as many guys as he can. Grant is going to ask his best subordinate, William Sherman, to take a place called Tunnel Hill, which is an extremely strategic place in the area. Now, if Sherman takes Tunnel Hill, the rebel position becomes extremely untenable. They'll be flanked. They'll be, you know, they'll be, yeah. they'll be in a tough spot. Claiborne's going to arrive like a, right in the nick of time and take position on Tunnel Hill. And he, which will become a real cramp in Grant's junk, because for <laughs> Sherman, you, you, I mean, you have to wonder at this point, like you know, Sherman must have seen that blue and white flag in his sleep, because <laughs> yeah, here we go again. He he gets there and he see he sees he sees Claiborne yet again in his front again. So on November twenty fifth, of course, the greatest day in the calendar, man, we know that. Yeah, Cla Claiborne is going to move his men to, on the defense of on Tunnel Hill, along with Shot Pouch Walker. Yep, and Car Great Carter name. Stevenson, who wasn't just Claiborne, and they're going to push. They're going to push back Sherman, and what's it, what this is going to force Grant to change his plan. This is kind of the, the big part of the Battle of Chickamauga. I mean, yeah. Chatt Chattanooga. This is going to force Grant to have George, the Rock of Mill Springs, Thomas, attack Missionary Ridge, which mm -hmm. will ultimately drive Bragg off the field. But Claiborne's line didn't break, and again, because Claiborne's line with Shaw Pouch and with Stevenson. They forced Grant to change his battle plan because they couldn't get through to Tunnel Hill. And this isn't an indictment of Sherman or anything like yeah. that, but it just it just didn't work out. There's a lot yeah. of stuff. There's a lot of stuff with Sherman going on at the time, and who knows? But but suffice it to say, they they finally do break through, um, and Bragg has to withdraw, which is catastrophic because Chattanooga was the was the gateway to the yeah. deep south, and it really opened the door for Grant to do many things. Now he, he yeah. could do whatever the hell he wanted, right? And you know, at this point, Bragg, you know, he, he needs to save his army, but it, and, and its supplies. So, so again, what does he do? He turns to arguably his most valuable general at this point to buy them time. And this is where Claiborne's story really picks up a wrinkle gap, right? Yeah. It, it, it'll add to that legacy of Claiborne being a smart and aggressive commander. You know, Claiborne had to buy time to allow Bragg's army to escape to Dalt, Georgia. And in and, and Ringgold, Georgia, uh, is where the Western and, and Atlantic Railroad runs between these two peaks, Taylor Ridge and the White Oak Mountain, right? And he, he was going to post guns on the ridge and, and where this bottleneck exists, and he's going to have much fewer men. Only 4,000 guys yeah. is all he has. But the, great, the ground is fantastic. It's a great place to put artillery. His nemesis this time 
will be fighting Joe Hooker, Mary, yep. who will take 16,000 men to try to chase Bragg, right? So right off the bat, four to one odds. But Ho- I mean, Hooker is Hooker, and he screws the whole thing up. He attacks piecemeal <laughs> and the whole thing. And But for five full hours, Claiborne is going to hold Hooker off, including that ferocious fight against David Ireland's 137 yep. New York, right? Right outside of Ringgold Station. Eventually, Hooker's going to have to fall back to Chattanooga, and Claiborne has bought enough time for Bragg's Army of Tennessee to fight another day. So if you're keeping track, Mary, Claiborne has now had success against Sherman two times, yep. and now Hooker. So he's fighting some pretty big generals at this point. Yeah. You know, that, that that's who, who he is. And, and what this did allow, it allowed the Confederates to get rest into winter camp in Dalton. And, and this is where, where those new promotions were to be had if he had new men to train. And so he gets another chance now to train guys and kind of deal with a whole new group. Yeah. Yeah. He um so he's gonna have his guys at this time are going to be um Lowry, Granberry, and um Lucius Polk is still with him and Govan. Right, but more oh, important, psycho, psychologically, Claiborne's on a heater now. I mean, oh, he, yeah. this is a, this is peak Claiborne success politically right now. He's got it right. He, he saved the army again, and now you know his 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 division is camped at a place called Tunnel Hill, Georgia. Different Tunnel Hill. Now he's Tunnel Hill, yeah. Georgia, right? And they're going to spend those months drilling. But there's an issue though, Mary, in that many of his men, their three year enlistment papers are running mm-hmm. up now. So it's hard to sell these men, you know, many who are missing their families. They're hearing rumors of the Union troops burning farms in their state. And they, you know, they, 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 you know, they don't want to be there. But Claiborne's going to basically remind his men patriotism and the Southern independence is the goal, blah, blah, blah. And it's going to work because a lot of his men re-enlisted. Now, admittedly, you know, the Confederates put the Constriction Act in later and those three, they yeah. would have had to come back anyway. But they would have stayed – they would, would not have gone home and forced to come back. They stayed. And so that, that that's a big deal for them. But the thing about it though, and it, when you this and this is this is where it gets important with this, they're running out of men. And to him, the war is a mathematical equation. And eventually the North superiority in manpower is ultimately going to win out. It's just going to. And the thought of trying to even the numbers is is in his head. Bragg's army is still kicking. It, it, like the other Confederate armies in the East are, but they're kind of running out of manpower. They're kind of running on borrowed time. They needed men to fill the ranks, and, and Claiborne felt you know, that, was, that was really their only chance. Yeah. If the true goal is Southern independence, they needed to do whatever it took to achieve this goal. He knew the men needed the, the South needed men more than Bruce Dickinson needed more cowbell at this point. Very, <laughs> they, 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 this was a desperate, desperate situation, right? And they all, and because they knew U.S. Grant was going to eventually win this war through attrition, which he mm-hmm. eventually did. But they yeah. knew they knew it was coming. So while in this winter camp, the men rested, and even their camp songs talked about this. In a song called "Annie Darling," it's a great song right here. The lyrics are sung: "Come, come, rain to the top of my boots." Oh, come and I think ye to keep back the Yankee units until our ranks are filled with recruits. So all their mm. songs are about, we need more dudes. Yep. Even the songs are about that. Now, this isn't exactly Elton John, but it tells a story of what the situation was at the time. Yep. And it was here, sitting down thinking about the issue, Claiborne is going to make his greatest political miscalculation. And he's going to touch that third rail of Southern politics which arguably stalled his, his career going forward. And what was that idea? He comes up on January 2nd, 1863. He has a meeting. Uh, Joseph E. Johnson is there. Hardy is there. William Bate, Hatton Anderson, W.H.T. Shot Pouch Walker, just to name a few, are there. And this is, uh, it's called Claiborne's Proposal. It's also called Claiborne's Emancipation. But it his, uh, his idea that in order to win the war, they need to put um, any able-bodied male slaves into the army and basically say, you will be emancipated. You will be freed if you do this. And part of what Claiborne said in this is it is said that slavery is all we are fighting for. And if we give it up, we give up all. Even if this were true, which we deny, slavery is not all our enemies are fighting for. 
It is merely the pretense to establish sectional superiority and a more centralized form of government and to deprive us of our rights and liberties. So he's basically saying we need to have our independence above all else and we need to get rid of slavery in order to gain our independence and gain men to fight in the army. Right. It was pure numbers on a standpoint, yeah. and it was a pretty pragmatic one. Claiborne was not an abolitionist by any stretch no. of imaginations. He saw this merely as a way to get more soldiers. And like I said, Claiborne is going to discuss this plan with his peers, and it's going to go over about as well as suggesting David Ortiz Day at Yankee Stadium is kind of how it goes. And it doesn't work well because no. in this Emancipation Proclamation, I, you know, you read a little bit about a little bit of it, but it goes on and on. Three or Claiborne writes, as between the loss of independence and the loss of slavery, we assume that every patriot will freely give up the latter, give up the Negro slave rather than be a slave himself. And he continues hinting that this might help with European intervention they yep. were kind of talking with. He writes, our country already has some friends in England and France, and there are strong motives to induce these nations to recognize and assist us, but they cannot assist us without helping, without helping slavery. And to this would be in conflict with their policy for the last quarter century. So this is what he's suggesting. And, and again, this comes up later on the next year in 1865 in, in some aspect, but it's too late at that point. It's not his but, idea. That his, his thing right. that he did is not known for a long time. But but when you're talking about a, a hard slave-owning, fun-loving Confederate like Shot Pouch Walker sitting yeah. there hearing this. He's not um, a happy man. I mean, he you, know, you can tell right off the bat he's pissed. Now, they try to squash this, but Walker oh. grabs it. He's going to send it to Richmond and make sure, by the way, the wild Irishman wrote this. This is Claiborne. I yeah. want his name attached to this. Needless to say, Richmond shot it down hard and fast, and Jefferson Davis ordered the ordered uh, Claiborne's idea completely suppressed, right? And it, it, the thing, nowhere specifically does it say Claiborne was blackballed the, within the army for mm-hmm. it, but it should be noted that at this moment, he was a superstar in the army. He already had been, but he'd been passed over after this four times for corps yep. command. Okay. He'd already been a temporary corps commander. So it's kind of easy to figure out why he didn't rise above his level. Although it's not, they're not going to write this down, but you can read between, between the lines with yeah, this. Yeah, you can figure it out, you know, what's going on. Um, and, you know, Shot Pouch Walker, he is like sitting there in this meeting and he's like, no, we're not doing this. He's, He's a slave owner. So is his mother. They own quite a few between the two of them. Um, and he's so offended that he says that, um, you know, it's treason and any officer advocating it should be held fully accountable. Uh, William Bate and Pat and Anderson are not happy with it either. But Walker is just he's livid. He's seeing red with it. Um, and anyway, he ends up so he goes to Claiborne after and he's like, yeah, can I have a copy of that? And Claiborne's like, yeah, of course you can. And Walker's like, oh, this is sedition and I'm sending it to Richmond to make sure they know about it. And Claiborne's like, have at it. I I want them to know. I want, I want the higher ups to yep. have this because Johnston had said no. And then Walker goes to Johnston and says, I have a copy. I'm sending it to Richmond. And Johnston is like, no, you're not. And Walker's like, I am. And he does. And as you said, Davis gets it and was like, Oh, we can't have this. And they, it's not discovered for a few years, I think. But Walker is still seething about it afterwards. Yeah, He's going to write everyone who attended the meeting demanding to know how they felt about it. And um, Hardy and Hindman and a few others did favor some aspects of it. But Hindman writes back to Walker, I do not choose to admit any inquis- inquisitorial right to you. So basically, dude, F off. I'm not telling you anything. Hindman was That's not, why I'm not a fan of Walker. Have, if you have a controversial idea, you say it. You don't write it. That's the problem, right? Yeah. But, but but again, this shows the confidence that Claiborne had. Yeah. Again, it, it was. You know, also during this winter in Dalton, you know, another aspect of Claiborne's life is going to change, right? Mm-hmm. His boss and close friend William Hardy is going to find himself a woman named Mary Lewis Foreman mm-hmm. and ask Claiborne to be his best man at their wedding in Demopolis, Alabama, in eighteen in January of eighteen sixty four. And at this wedding, Claiborne, of course, goes. He's going to meet a woman. From Mobile, Alabama, named Mary uh, Mary Mary Foreman's maid of honor, named Susan Tarleton, right? Yep. And she was the daughter of a prominent cotton trader in Mobile. It may sound cliche, 
Um, but it sounds like Claiborne, you know, fell in love with first sight, right? That's he, ad- what happens. he admitted that to Nash. He wrote Nash a letter or he saw Nash afterwards, his former business partner and said, I've fallen in love at first sight with this woman. She's 24 years old. Claiborne just became instantly enamored with her. And I mean, Claiborne is awkward as hell with women. Like he wrote, um, there's like examples of his poetry that he wrote some women. It's terrible. Like it's not good poetry. Um, but he was really shy, really awkward around women. But but something about Sue kind of just, he was like, I'm going to go for this. And he asks her before he has to go back to the army. He says, he's like, well, will you marry me? And she's like, no, but you can write me if you want. Because we haven't known yeah, each other pretty, for that pretty, long. Pretty bold. I mean, to, to, I mean to, to, to ask the chick to marry me. It's so funny because, you know, he... he... <laughs> He does, and then he does the whole typical guy thing, where you know he he reaches out to Robert Tarleton, Susan's brother, right? Yeah. And, and, and who told another who told other bridesmaid named Sally Lightfoot, poor Sue is like the last rose of summer. She needs you to advise her about General Claiborne. She is in perplexity, and you know you would you would be much assistance to help her out. And so basically, he's trying to save hook me up he's trying to you know, help me up with this yeah you know at, after the wedding claiborne's going to return to camp near tunnel hill georgia and even but this is what his staff noticed how different he was oh yeah irving buck said he like there's something going on like he's so different well, he, he's so he was light-hearted. laughing he was lighthearted. he was singing songs about the carpenters to everybody he, he just he just had <laughs> he he was he was bitten hard by the love by the was love he singing bug, that right? like why do birds suddenly appear he is was that that's probably what it was <laughs> but you mentioned irvin buck i mean irvin buck he writes Rumor has it General Claiborne lost his heart with a young lady in Mobile. He's been in a heavenly mood and talks about another leave already. So basically, he was he was a grumpy bastard a lot of the time, apparently, after this, because they're like, whoa, he's in a really good mood now. Oh, he was. But uh, Claiborne gets awarded a 12 day, a 12 day leave in late February. And he raced back to Mobile a fashion. You would go to the bar at happy hour. I mean, he got there. He high stepped it pretty quickly. And he, he, he asked her, you know, again, to he'd asked her, you know, was looking for an answer. You know, I asked her to marry me. What's the friggin' And deal? she's finally but, like, okay, fine. No, actually, I think she was really happy. I think she was really in love with him, too. Oh, he was. He wrote about her after keeping me in cruel suspense for six weeks. She has at last consented to be mine. And we are engaged. So in March, when his leave was over, he had to return to the army. And, and, yeah. he, and they wrote each other constantly. They totally did. I yeah. know you were, you know, all this stuff. Oh, they, you know? they totally were. And this is also the time, um, you know, it's winter and it's, you know, not campaign season. It's between that. But so on March 22nd, 1864, which was 160 years ago today, um, five inches of snow had fallen and there was a snowball fight. So it's the anniversary of the snowball fights that happen um, in the army of Tennessee during this, this winter. Uh, one soldier said that they were like, you know, just kind of throwing snowballs at each other. They were, you know, cramming snow into each other's mouth and ears. Like, and I mean, keep in mind, these these guys might not have seen this much snow before. But what happened is Polk's brigade attacks Govan's brigade and Claiborne got involved and he leads the attack on Govan's campsite and he gets, quote unquote, captured. And yep. when the fight was over, Claiborne gave all the men a ration of whiskey. And whether this is also that Claiborne is so happy that he finally has Sue Tarleton, you know, or or whatever, but he's partaking in this with, with the common soldiers. He's having a snowball fight with them. And there's going to be two more. There's going to be one on March 23rd, and there's going to be one on the 31st that Johnston organizes. And, and Hardy gets involved in a few other ones as well. But it's just this kind of, you know... It's like this break in the campaigning, the battles, and these these boys are able to kind of be boys again and have fun. And Claiborne is is clearly the ha- perhaps the happiest he's ever been in his entire life. You know, he's finally found a home, um, and he's got Sue Tarleton, who is you know honestly the love of his life. Oh, I mean, they're planning a wedding in June of eighteen sixty four. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think Shot Pouch got to save the date. I don't think he got one. <laughs> You know, realistically speaking, <laughs> I don't think but he the, was but, anybody's favorite. No, but, but little little did Claiborne know that his former nemesis, William T. Sherman, is going to screw up his wedding plans. Right. Yeah. And sadly, Claiborne and Sue Tarleton are never going to see each other and, again. No, I don't spoil the ending here, but that's going to be about it. While Sherman's march delayed the wedding, Sue was distraught. She wrote to that Sarah Lightfoot. She wrote, 
heard that this next day his corps, you know, Claiborne's corps, was to move across the Chattahoochee River and take position in Sherman's rear. This he, puts an end to his visit. I don't know how I'm going to get through it. Right. So again, you know, this this leads for what's going to turn into May 27th of 64, which is going to be where Claiborne's going to rush to the Union right, the Confederate right flank of the Battle of Pickett's Mill. Right. Yep. That's where this is going to be in Dallas. And this is where Claiborne's division now, that battle test division is going to fight. We talked about that against Howard. A month later, June 27th, Claiborne's going to be front and center at the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain. And he's going to stall Sherman's frontal attack again. And once again, Sherman is probably seeing hard, that hardy flag in his sleep again because they yep. know these guys are again. Probably never left. And, no. Oh, but, you know, despite the efforts to delay Sherman, you know, the Army of Tennessee commander, Joseph E. Johnson, his delaying tactics really only showed, slowed Sherman down. And before long, the Rebs are going to get pushed all the way back to Atlanta. And that, as you know, that's the final straw for Jeff Davis. That's going to be the yeah. end of that. And at this point, Davis is going to famously replace Joseph Johnston with the aggressive John Bell Hood. Yeah. who had the reputation of being a decorated hard fighter. Some people thought he might be a little reckless, but hey, it is what it is. He's, he's yeah. a hard fighter. And you know, one of, in, one of Claiborne's long-term associates and one of his staffers, a guy named L.H. Mangum, described Claiborne's opinion of Johnston's removal in favor of Hood. And according to Mangum, he writes, Claiborne considered the removal of Joseph E. Johnson and the appointment of General Hood as a great disaster for the Army and Confederacy. OK, mm -hmm. now it should, it should, you know, he also noted that Claiborne, you know, that Claiborne too little of the political general about him to conceal, conceal his views. Hence, General Hood had no good feeling about Claiborne. Now, mm -hmm. again, this is hearsay from different people. So take all yep. this stuff with a grain of salt. But this is the stuff that's being said behind back and forth. Yeah. Right. And it's by people so, who are who are close to Claiborne. As well. Um, the other thing, too, that happens to Claiborne during the Atlanta campaign, and it's fairly early on, is he learns of the death of his brother, Kit. Um, mm -hmm. Kit was, Kit, also called Christopher, was in, he was part of uh, John Hunt Morgan's cavalry, which we also did an episode on. And he's killed in a skirmish at Dublin, Kentucky um, on May 10th, 1864, and he's only 23 years old. So Claiborne learns of that. His brother has died in the Civil War, as you know. So that had to be devastating news, too. Um, but yeah, this, you know, when John Bell Hood takes command, I think it is, um, it's mixed how people feel about it. Um, you know, Johnson was kind of, I think he was, as you say, slowing down the clock kind of thing, but Davis wanted a fighter and John Bell Hood was obviously the fighter that he wanted, you know? Oh, there's, there's no, there's no question. This is not an indictment of any, any decisions no. they made, but, but this is what it was. I mean, you know, now he's in charge on July 22nd. Hood, you know, Hood wants to seize the initiative from Sherman. He attacks James McPherson's line. And again, Claiborne gets the call like he always does. He'll hit the Union flank and come close to breaking it, but eventually he's going to have to fall back. And this, again, leads that cat and mouse game between Hood and Sherman while that grip is tightening around Atlanta, right? And, and you know, the Rebs desperately want to hold Macon and the Western Railroad line. You know, so in August of 1864, Hardy is going to arrive in Jonesboro, Georgia, about 25 miles south of Atlanta, and attack Union troops looking to cut the railroad tracks there, right? And again, Claiborne is temporarily going to be placed in, uh, in charge of Hardy's corps at this yeah. point. Uh, and the, but the attack on August 31st fails, primarily because Stephen D. Lee screws up and attacks too early, Shocker. and the timing is all screwed. It just, it just <laughs> was, but, but, basically, but basically Claiborne's personally leading this attack. It is, it is a hand-to-hand -hand fighting combat, and, and eventually he's going to fall back again. But the month of September goes back, goes by, and, and really both armies, they kind of hit a lull going into October. Yep. Hood pulls his army of Tennessee into northern Georgia to attack Sherman's supply line. He'll then continue northern Alabama, um, hoping Sherman's kind of going to leave Atlanta and follow Sherman, but I mean, follow him, but Sherman doesn't take the bait. No, he goes the other and way. He goes, he goes, he does his march for the sea and that goes on. But Hood decides to keep going north and he's going to try, he wants to seize Nashville. And around this time, Claiborne runs into an old friend of his from the past, Mary. He runs into Dr. Charles Nash, mm -hmm. that former pharmacy owner back in Helena, who hired him back in the day when he first moved to Arkansas. In their conversation, Nash asked Claiborne about, you know, about their chances going forward. And Claiborne being the his historical study, he says, 
We are going to take the war into Africa, but I fear that we will not be as successful as Scipio was. Referring to the Roman attack on Carthage in 205 AD. Always fun to mention Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. So the hell of name. Studied is, right? that gentleman quite a bit in my classical study days. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 Hood's army is going to it will move north into Tennessee, and their Union commander John Schofield has two Union corps that were detached from Sherman's army. Right, Hood wants to cross the Duck River and cut the Columbia Pike in half near Spring Hill, Tennessee, and Claiborne's men were asked to basically lead the march. You know, lead the march to, to, yep. to Spring Hill. Now Schofield saw this began to head there too. And again, we're not going to go into details of this, but suffice it to say, but whatever happened, somewhere in the Army of Tennessee, there was a miscommunication, yep. right? That led to the halting of the rebel attack when night fell. And when morning came, Schofield's Union men had passed through Spring Hill towards Franklin when the Rebs slept as close as 100 yards away from the turnpike when these troops marched down. And Schofield's going to dig in at Franklin and Hood's going to pursue them Um He'll, he'll pursue them death really badly, but he wants to bag Schofield before he can get to pass Franklin over the mm -hmm. Harpeth River into Nashville, right? The Harpeth, the, the bridge that went across the Harpeth was down. Yep. So they knew that if they can, they can get them, they had him pinned, right? And, you know, there's a lot of he said, she said that goes on between what happened between Spring Hill and Franklin yep. among the Army of Tennessee. But to, but to say the least, that no one really knows 100% certainty of what was said for sure. But that being said, you know, there, there are accounts of stories told by generals who were at the Battle of Franklin discussing conversations they had personally with Patrick Claiborne, right? And again, this is a tough time because you, you just, you think you have them beat some sort of snafu yeah. happens. We're not putting blame on anybody with this, but Schofield gets by. Schofield does a really good thing. He gets by. He gets, he gets by. He should, get, he, should, he should get more credit than the Confederate yeah. screwing up, admittedly he does. But he does get by. But there's a lot of pissed off Confederates about it. Because it just, it just, because he slipped right through the fingers. Major General John C. Brown reportedly riding with Claiborne, who told him the commanding general, Hood, was endeavoring to place upon him, Claiborne, the responsibility of allowing the enemy to pass our position on the night previous, and my information comes through a reliable channel. Brown, right, Brown wrote, I then asked Claiborne, who is responsible for the escape of the enemy? Who Claiborne said, of course, the responsibility rests with the commander in chief, as he was upon the field during the afternoon and was fully advised during the night of the movement of the army. Now, again, no one knows what Claiborne was told and by whom, yeah. but it's clear that Claiborne was feeling, for whatever reason, that he was being blamed for Schofield's escape. And now, again, this is according to Claiborne. We don't know what Hood said to him. We don't know what other people said. Yeah. But it's it's easy to say at that moment, Claiborne felt that he was being fingered for it. Yeah, and he there was a breakfast that happened. Claiborne was not there. And that's apparently where the blame was kind of laid on him by John Bell Hood. Allegedly, again, we don't know. None of us were there. John Bell Hood did write in his memoirs um, years later after this happened. He said, he, Claiborne, therefore made a sudden and firm resolution to me in all my operations, believing that my movements and manner of handling troops were based upon correct principles. It has been said that he stated upon the morning after the affair of Spring Hill that he would never again allow one of my orders for battle to be disobeyed if he could prevent it. For these reasons, his loss became doubly great to me. The heroic career and death of this distinguished soldier must never, must ever endear the memory of his last words to his commander and should entitle his name to be inscribed in immortal characters in the annals of our history. So that is John Bell Hood telling what seems, you know, this is a, you know, this is a completely different Claiborne than we're hearing from the account that you had. And again, this goes back to, to how difficult it is to figure out this period between Spring Hill and Franklin and what exactly happened. You know, we'll never know. It's somewhere in the middle. With no, and, and, and anybody who claims that this is one hundred percent happened, this is zero percent happened, um, it, it's just it's just foolish no. because no no one really knows. It's all interpretive. We'll never but know. I mean, I have my own opinion. You know, like we all have our own opinions on how it went down, how it happened, and all that. Um, you know, like I'm sure there was a lot of anger that morning. You know, going into Franklin, 
um, and what happened at Spring Hill. And there was a lot of miscommunication that happened was, as well. But it, but it happens. It happens in all armies. But upon, yeah. upon reaching Franklin, Captain Irving Buck, you mentioned, from Claiborne's staff and probably the closest staff officer who wrote about what they saw in Franklin before the battle, he writes, upon his arrival at Winstead Hill, which is about three miles south of Franklin, Whilst awaiting the formation of his command, he ascended to the summit, raised his glasses upon a stump, and gazed long at the enemy's entrenchments. Claiborne said they were very formidable. General Daniel Daniel Govan, sometimes Groven, you may see him. Groven. Govan, or Groven, <laughs> right? And he commanded one of Claiborne's Arkansas brigades. He wrote of Claiborne's uh, concerns about attacking the federal position. Uh, Govan wrote, General Claiborne has just returned from a consulta consultation with General Hood and his other generals, all of whom were opposed to attacking the main pike as the enemy could have been flanked and compelled to abandon his position so that was strongly positioned fortified. General Claiborne seemed to be more very well dis uh, despondent as I'd ever seen him. And as I said before he left, well, General, what does he say? If we are to die, let us die like men. Well, he says, first, well, General, there will not be many of us who will get back to Arkansas, yeah. to which Claiborne responded, yes, well, Governor, if we are going to die, let us die like men. So this was kind of a feeling of, of um, you know, they, they kind of, it was kind of the, at the end of the story. They knew how it was going to end, right? It was like they, they had they, resigned, they, resigned themselves they, right, to they, it. Right. They, they resigned the fact. So on November 30th of 1864, at a boot, 4 p.m., Right. The order was given and 15,000 men marched across the open fields towards the federal entrenchments when Union artillery opened up on them, beginning the Battle of Franklin. Right. Now, the Union infantry, you know, they had their musket fire. They, they were told to hold it as long as possible. And then when they finally began firing on Claiborne's men. And the, the story of Patrick Claiborne's death was told again by Captain Irvin Buck. Right. And he wrote both, you know, that both of his both of his horses, Stonewall and Red Pepper, yeah, right, had both been injured. So he rode a borrowed horse, and, and he and, and this is what Buck wrote: the general went into battle on a borrowed horse, and where which he was which was killed under him. One of his couriers, James Brandon of Mississippi, dismounted to give him his horse, which was killed by a cannon shot, and the general was in the act was in the act of mounting. Not stopping to get another animal, Claiborne proceeded by foot to lead his men. General Govett, he writes a letter about Claiborne's death as well. He wrote, his courier brought him another horse, and in the act of mounting, it was killed. He then disappeared into the smoke, and that was the last time I saw him alive. I saw him waving his cap and urging his men forward. And when the battle ended, you know, Claiborne was, was, was missing. They yeah. didn't know what happened. He just disappeared. And it caused, obviously, as you can imagine, it caused concern. Govan wrote about that. He wrote, the terrible report that Claiborne was missing ran through our ranks that whole dreadful night. We almost prayed that he might have been wounded only or been captured, but that was not meant to be. I and two others were the first to discover his dead body at early dawn the next morning. He was about 40 or 50 yards from the works. He lay flat on his back as if asleep, his military cap partly over his eyes. He had on a new gray uniform, the coat of the sack of a blouse pattern. It was unbuttoned and open. He wore a white shirt with blood on the front part of the left side, just under the abdomen. This was the only sign of a wound I saw in him, and I believe it was the only one he received. Now, Claiborne's body was obviously touched by someone after he died. Mm -hmm. His shoes were gone. His watch and sword belt were also missing. But he was also laid out ceremoniously by someone who had taken the time to do it. And we, we've talked about the speculation of what mm -hmm. that was. And, and a lot of people think that it was laid out by a, by a Freemason. By mm -hmm. the way, he was laid out. But again, it's again, it's speculation. There are certain things that ways he was laid out that that le definitely led to that. But again, it's all speculation. His body was first buried in Columbia, and then sent to Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, before being interred and buried for good back in Helena in 1870. Right, and it's it, it, you can imagine an old Sue Tarleton back home with this, right? Yeah. And and she finds out of Claiborne's death five days later. You know how she finds out about us? In the newspapers. She's working in her garden. Yeah. And the newspaper boy comes riding by yelling, read all about it. 
Big news and big battle in Franklin. General Claiborne is killed. That's how she finds out about it by the newspaper boy. Yeah. Right. The news obviously crushed her, and she realized her wedding day with Patrick would never come. You know, she, you know, it's, you know, she did move on. She got in 1867. She did get re, she got married yeah. to a Major Hugh Lang Cole, an officer on Braxton Bragg staff of all people. Yeah. A year later, she's going to be pregnant with their first child, and she's going to suffer a brain hemorrhage and die on June 30th, 1868. Yeah. So she's going to die young too. And and, and thing about Patrick Claiborne, and, and you know. You know, today he remains probably one of the South's most respected generals whose battlefield leadership earned him that nickname Stonewall of the West. But like we said at the beginning, you know, Claiborne's history and reputation is certainly the eye of the beholder. Mm-hmm. But it can't be denied that he fought hard to achieve his goal of Southern independence and give and, and gave his life for it. You know, early in the war, you know, Claiborne is to, to have said, if this, the Confederacy, that is so dear to my heart is doomed to fail. I pray heaven may let me fall with it while my face is toward the enemy and my arm battling for that which I know to be right. Mm-hmm. Now, unfortunately for Claiborne, that's going to be, uh, he's going to yeah. be right about that. Yeah. And Robert E. Lee said of him, um, on the field of battle, he shone like a meteor, meteor in a clouded sky. So even Robert E., General Robert E. Lee knows of him. Uh, General Hardy said, where his division division de- defended, no odds broke its lines. Where it attacked, no numbers resisted its onslaught, save only once. And there, and there is the grave of Claiborne and his heroic division. Uh, John Bell Hood said of him, Claiborne was a man of equally quick, quick perception and a strong character and was especially in one respect in advance of many of our people. And he is referring to Claiborne's emancipation. Uh, which would have come out years after the Civil War, but Hood was around to know about it, obviously. Um, and then when Claiborne was reinterred in 1870 in Hel- Helena, Arkansas, uh, General um, George Gordon gave a speech there about him, and he said, a truer patriot or knightlier soldier never fought and never died. Valor never lost a braver soldier or freedom, a nobler champion. He was a patriot by instinct and a soldier by nature. He loved his country, its soldiers, its banners, its battle flags, its sovereignty, its independence. For these he fought, for these he fell. And that's who Patrick Claiborne was. I mean, again, he's a, he's a controversial guy. He's a romantic type of, of, of people who look back on him. Um, Craig Simon's book, Stonewall of the West, tells a great, a great story with this. Oh, it's this. an amazing biography. And, and, and it, abs- it absolutely is. But again, at the end of the day, like any part of history, it's all part of interpretation. There are people who think that his his personality, his presence is very overrated, especially at the Battle of Franklin. It's over embellished the way Chamberlain is at Gettysburg, or perhaps. But again, that's why we study history, and that's why yeah. you read this stuff. And you can all people are, the, the history is only as good as the quotes who tell the story. And if you tell the story, which is very clear about Patrick Claiborne, he was extremely respected by his men. He yep. was extreme, the men fought hard for him. He, he expected a lot of his men. His upbringing him gave him a level of honor. His experience in Helena gave him a true home to fight for, and he fought for it. And through fighting for the Confederacy in this case, he was able to live the, the honorable life that I think he felt that he let his father down when he didn't get into medical school. Yep. And I, I think I think it was a redemption story for him all along. And I think at the end of the day, he knew he was going to have to go into that battle of frankly probably wasn't going to come out but he knew that he was going to get there or die trying and i think he was probably fine either way yeah he he's a story that you know he's born in ireland and i know there's you know some people that are like well where you're born is your home but he truly found his home in helena arkansas and that's what he was fighting for is is his home he didn't really i don't think he really understand he understood the true causes of the uh, causes of the civil war you know, and I think he's respected on the Union side, too. I, I know all of Rhoda's Howard. There's, well, this is our second Howard reference. Howard refers to Claiborne in his memoirs as the formidable foe. So somebody that was, you know, it's like if we're going up against him, he he's a good fighter. And, you know, unlike Chamberlain at Gettysburg, Claiborne does not get to write his story after the war. He doesn't get to tell it. And that's why... You know, these quotes we have from, you know, something like Spring Hill and Franklin are afterwards and Claiborne can't step in and say, no, this is how it happened. So somewhere in between all those quotes, 
that we have about how things went down um, is the truth. And we'll never know 100% what happened at that at that point in history. It doesn't. It doesn't. So I think that's a good place to drop this off right here. I, th- I think it's a story that's well told. I, th- I think it's uh, uh, he's a fascinating guy. And he's someone who I think, um, no matter what side of the of the army on, you you ever, ever you ever gonna appreciate a redemption story. But I think he's somebody who um, I, I think somebody who 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 I think if he looked back, I think he felt that he did the Claiborne name proud, and I think that was a big part yep. of his of his situation. So what's coming up for us next? So next, uh, we are gonna have our first book club of um, 2024 on April 16th. We are gonna be joined by. Um, uh, Ed Lowe, uh, to talk about his new book, A Fine Opportunity Lost, which is about James Longstreet's uh, East Tennessee campaign. So that's going to be seven o'clock Eastern via Zoom, Civil War Breakfast Club at gmail.com. We will send you an invite to that. We're going to be having our next roundtable again soon as well, um, and hopefully announcing more of our book clubs as well. But we have our first one, Fine Opportunity Lost which is about Longstreet by, by Ed Lowe, Colonel Ed Lowe. All right. So why don't we jump off? It's a, it's a long episode, but I think it's a good episode to do. So any final words from you, Fincheru? No, thanks for bringing it like you always do. And we're on to the next one. And thanks we're to all our, to all, and thanks, thanks to all our listeners. Thanks Absolutely. To all. So, so if you're, hope your, your basketball team is doing well, hope your hockey team is doing well, unless you're for Boston University, then the hell with that. But otherwise, we're off we go. Live is going to be tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. Hope you can join us. A lot of fun stuff coming up for us down the road. So off we go. Mary, again, the pleasure, as always, was always, always yours, as you know. And everyone, we appreciate you listening. Have a great Friday night. We'll see you all on the other side. See you all later. Peace out. Bye.